Okay, this sermon we're going to continue talking about Satan. We read through Job 1 and 2 because in those two chapters we actually get a lot of insight into Satan and a lot of insight into what he's capable of. So, you know, last week we talked about a bit about who Satan was, where he came from, you know, the fact that he's not in hell. But today we're going to talk more about the character and abilities of Satan and why you know, God created Satan uh, well, why, he, why Satan exists to begin with. So let's start off where we started off last week. 2 Corinthians 2.9 For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive us anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. See, if you're ignorant of Satan's devices, he may get an advantage over you. And you don't want Satan to have an advantage over you or over us. And, you know, we're not ignorant of his devices, less chance that Satan will get an advantage over us. So let's talk a bit about Satan's character, first of all. Satan's character. So the first one is Satan has power in this world. You know, I know those of us in this church, we know that, you know, one that's pulling the strings in the back, you know, as you go up higher and higher, you know, some people think it's the Jews, some people think it's the bankers, some people think it's, but you know, if you keep going all the way, the top of that pyramid, you know, Satan, he's the one that's influencing all the things in the background. And the Bible even talks about him having a seat of authority in the world. Now, where that seat is, people may disagree, you know, maybe today it's in the United Nations, who knows? But, you know, back then, in Revelation, he had a seat in Pergamos. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest. Look, even where Satan's seat is. So isn't that interesting that even in the very location where Satan is ruling, Right? He has this seat, and maybe he has people there that rule on his behalf and whatnot, but there's a specific location here in Pergamos where the seat is, and yet, even in the darkest of places, light can spring up, and a church in Pergamos can still be doing great works for God, even in that area. So, you know, it's a dark world out there. You know, even countries that are dark, places that are oppressed, places that are wicked, even where Satan's seat is. And don't give up. Don't lose hope. Don't, don't stop doing the work of God. That doesn't mean some great works can't be done, even in the darkest of places. And yet if Christians throw up their hands and say, oh, it doesn't make a difference what I do, hey, well, the church in Pergamos was probably getting a lot of people saved, even in Pergamos, even where Satan's seat is. And that hold us fast my name. And as to not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelt. So Satan has a seat, he has power in this world, his influence, right? Matthew 12, 26, if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? You see how he has authority in this world, he has a kingdom, he has a seat where he rules and reigns from. Some more about Satan's character. Satan, he wants to divide believers. Divide believers. Luke twenty two thirty one 31 says here, Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So like Satan walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour he is out to sift us like wheat you know he wants to divide when you know when you sift wheat you're trying to divide up the clumps and that's what satan is trying to do he divides up very friends you know and you know a lot of contention starts in a church and that's like sort of the influence the pride the worldliness that comes in and people start to be divided they start to be contention instead of satan having to get in there personally his influence already his worldliness and the contention and the pride starts to divide people 
and he sifts us as wheat. And we need to be wary of that so that we don't allow Satan to get advantage of us if we're not ignorant of his devices. And one device he has is he divides friends, he divides believers to start fighting against one another rather than fighting against him. I mean, isn't that what you would want? If you were Satan, if you were Satan, you'd rather get people busy fighting each other rather, rather than fighting you. And then you're free to then go about and cause your havoc. What else do we know about Satan? Well, we know that Satan is ungodly, but he also tempts people with ungodliness as well. We look at the temptation of Jesus Christ in the garden where he is tempted, uh, in the wilderness, sorry, not in the garden, where he's tempted of Satan. We can learn a bit about Satan's devices. Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he was afterward unhungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So that's one of our memory verses, Luke 4.4. 4. So what is this first temptation? So these temptations, they, they line up a bit with the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And the lust of the flesh here is obviously the desire to eat. So he's saying, command these stones that will be made bread. But it's not just the temptation to eat. The temptation is lined up with the denial that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So you see how he's saying here, if thou be the Son of God, command these stones, this stone that it be made bread. He's tempting Jesus with the lust of the flesh to prove that he is the Son of God by doing this miracle. But how does that line up with, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God? Well, it's because God's word declared Jesus the Son of God. And the way I see this is, God's word should be enough to declare something and for it to be true. So it's like saying here, well, God's word was not enough change this stone into bread to prove that you're the son of God. But he's saying, no, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So if God's word was sufficient to prove that he's the son of God. He doesn't have to prove himself by this miracle that Satan is tempting him with. But we see the lust of the flesh there. And we see as well, you know, as Jesus responds to the temptations, all three times he is responding with God's word. That's why it's so important that you know God's word because you're going to combat the temptations of Satan with God's word like Jesus did here. Luke 4, 5, And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So see, there's the lust of the eyes. He's showing him these temptations. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And whomsoever I will, I give it. See, we just talked about Satan having authority in this world, having power, and he's able to tempt people by giving them certain things, material wealth, power. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So the temptation, the lust of the eyes there, but the temptation was, you know, do you serve God? Well, you serve mammon. And he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And I think that last one lines up with the pride of life. You know, that he's sort of showing his power, that he can all, oh, he can fall off the temple and uh, not be hurt. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. So Satan is out to tempt people with sin. He wants people to sin against God. He wanted the Son of God to sin against God. And that's one, that's part of his character, right? Revelation 2. Look at some of the temptations that Satan brought into this church in Thyatira. These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. 
I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. So he commends the churches, but he also says here, like in verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. So she wasn't just encouraging people to commit fornication, tempting them to commit fornication, but also commit fornication with her, this woman that was teaching in the church of Thyatira. How wicked is this? And I'll put her into great, and I will, with, uh, who commit fornication, that commit fornication with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts, and I will give every one of you according to your works. But, I, but unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many, look at this, have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. So we see, in Thyatira, the depths of Satan is what? We see women preachers, fornication, adultery, and idolatry. See, so here specifically is, you know, idolatry, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. But, you know, I, I don't, you know, when I think of this situation in Thyatira, it reminds me of all these online influencers these days. These women online influencers, and they're doing the, the OnlyFans and the, the TikTok and whatnot, and they're trying to uh, you know, seduce people, and they're trying to like say that it's all right to commit fornication, there's nothing wrong with that, hey, and if you're not happy in your marriage, just leave your husband and, you know, uh, do what's right for you, make yourself happy. This reminds me, this is probably the sort of things that just Jezebel was saying in Thyatira. Now let's go on to 1 Corinthians 7. So we see here, this is what Satan is pushing, this ungodliness, this worldliness, and we need to be aware of this. 1 Corinthians 7, this is in line with even what was Talk, talked about in Revelation 2. Defraud ye not one the other. This is talking about a married couple. Except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again. Look at this. That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So think about this. We have in Revelation 2 Satan pushing fornication, pushing adultery through this prophetess quote unquote jezebel and then we see in first corinthians 7 that if a married couple is apart for too long they are going to be tempted of satan so isn't this interesting that satan himself takes an interest in actually trying to divide marriages between believers you see here so 1 Corinthians 7 is about, you know, having a wife. Make sure you have that, that strong relationship. And sometimes you'll fast, but he's saying here, when you fast and you keep yourselves from one, one, one another, hey, make sure you come together again, because otherwise Satan is going to tempt you, not tempt you for your incontinency. By not coming together, you have a temptation to what? Commit fornication, to commit adultery. So isn't it interesting that Satan knows the value of, of a marriage enough that he personally gets in between marriages to try and tempt people to commit adultery. Let's go on. Some other characteristics of Satan. 2 Corinthians 11, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to to their works. So what's another important characteristic that we need to know of Satan? That he appears as good, not as bad. So in the movies, you know, and on TV, you see evil is always portrayed as dark, dark hair, you know, red, you know, all these sorts of things. You think about in all the movies that you watch, good is light, 
evil is dark. But is that what Satan is like? When you see the evil things of Satan in the world, is it going to be darkness? No, it's going to be shown as light. You know, his ministers are going to be seen like the Pharisees. You know, Jesus said, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall no wise enter in the kingdom of heaven. So outwardly, they appear righteous, but inwardly, they are full of dead men's bones. So just because somebody appears righteous, just because somebody appears like light, that doesn't mean they aren't full of dead men's bones. Now, how do you know the tree? The tree is known by its fruit, right? What is the fruit? I believe the fruit is the things that they teach. That's how you know a false prophet. Because you're not going to know a false prophet by how they look, are you? Are you going to know a false prophet by necessarily how they behave? Because the, the Pharisees were right. They seemed righteous outwardly. No, you know the false prophets by what they say. Matthew 7, 15. Look, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So you see, on the outward appearance, they look like sheep. On the outward, they may appear gentle, but it's the things that they teach. That's the problem. All right, let's go on. Revelation 2, 9. We see here that Satan, last characteristic of Satan, before we go on to some other things, Satan has a religion. Satan has a religion. And it's not the church of Satan. And you think, oh, Satan has a religion, it's the church of Satan? No, that's, too, that's, that's the wolf appearing like a wolf. No, how does the wolf appear like a sheep? He's going to pretend to be God's chosen people. This is why here, Revelation 2, 9, it says here, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Look, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So let me ask you, what people is there today that blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ, that call themselves Jews, but the Bible says they are not, and they have synagogues? You see, so these Jews today, quote-unquote, the Bible says, hey, they are of the synagogue of Satan. This is Satan's religion in the Bible, right? The blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. This is not the only place it says it in Revelation. Look at Revelation 3. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I am have loved thee. So, today, you have a nation that calls themselves Jews, and you have Christians all around the world saying, we need to bless Israel, we need to pray for Israel. But is that the Israel they're meant to be praying for? You know, the one that was brought together by the UN in 1948? You know, maybe that's a sermon I've got to preach another day, but, you know, these people are of Antichrist. They are not of God. And Christians should not be worshipping them like they are of God because they deny the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and they blaspheme his name. They call themselves Jews, but they are not, and the Bible calls them the synagogue of Satan. All right, let's go on. Now let's talk a bit about Satan's abilities. Satan's abilities. This is why we looked at Job 1 and 2 this morning. Job 1 and 2 this morning gives us a lot of insight into Satan's abilities. So in Job 1, it says here, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So we talked a bit about that last week, where Satan is able to travel between earth and heaven, because here, where God has allowed Satan to tempt Job, God, or Satan, is able to be in the presence of the Lord in heaven. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's, eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were ploughing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell them. So one of Satan's abilities is, to ab is, is he is able to move a band of foreigners to invade and, you know, pillage somebody's property and land, you know, and kill their servants. So 
you know, even though we think, well, the Sabaeans just came in, but, you know, they were moved by Satan in order to do that. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep, and the servants consumed, and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So notice that there is fire coming down from heaven. This is a miraculous type of supernatural event. And yet, what does the servant say? The servant says the fire of God is fallen down. So you see how sometimes people attribute things to God where it may actually be Satan causing these things. And he's able to do supernatural things where he's able to bring fire down from heaven. So is God the only one that is able to bring fire down from heaven? No, Satan is able to as well. Burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, so this is the servant, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So again, we have him moving the Chaldeans to come in, the camels and the servants. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So what is happening here in verse 19? This is a natural disaster. So you know how natural disasters in insurance claims and things like that, they'll say, well, we don't cover acts of God. But is God the only one capable of creating natural disasters. Here, this is like a tornado that has come and torn a house apart. You know, they may be assuming that this is either just nature or it's God, but who was it? It was Satan. Satan was actually able to cause this great wind that blew this house down and killed all of Job's family inside that house. So that's something people don't always know and they sometimes like it says in Job 1, they charge God foolishly. They blame God for things, and it may not have been God, right? It may have been Satan. Job 2, 7. So this is another thing that Satan is able to do. So when Satan, uh, so, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. So another thing that Satan is capable of is creating physical infirmity. So is that always the reason why people have physical illnesses? No, but is it one reason why some people do? Well, in, say, in Job's case, it was. You know, why was he getting boils from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot? Well, it was because Satan had the power to be able to do that and to create that physical infirmity. Uh, let's go on. Luke 13, here's another example of Satan causing a physical infirmity in somebody. The ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, and them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? So they were criticizing Jesus for healing somebody on the Sabbath day. But Jesus is saying, Hey, you have an ox. And when they're in trouble, even on the Sabbath day, you'll help an ox. But he says here in verse 16, And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound low these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? So you see how she had this physical infirmity due to Satan binding her in this infirmity. Now that's not the cause, like I said, of everyone's infirmity, but that is one of the causes of infirmity. 1 Thessalonians 2. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. So another thing Satan is capable of is he is able to stop people from traveling. So here, where Paul was trying to get from one place to another, Satan personally intervened and stopped him from traveling from one place to another. We don't know exactly how that played up, but Satan is able to do that. 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2. What else is Satan capable of? 
And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. So Satan is capable of miracles. So sometimes people will see somebody online doing supernatural things and think, well, how can they not be of God when they can do these supernatural things? Well, this is why you can't be ignorant of Satan and what he's capable of, because even Satan and his devils are capable of doing miraculous things, supernatural things. And just like here in the end times where you've got the beast and the false prophet, right? the false prophet is going to be doing a lot of miracles, pointing people to the beast. And it says here that his working is after the power of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now let's talk a bit about demon possession. Demon possession. Demon possession is a, is a real thing. You know, you don't have to read too far into the New Testament. You know, read through the Gospels. People are possessed with devils. People are being, having devils cast out of them. You know, demon possession is a real thing. Satan also is capable of demon possession. We see here in John 13, 26, Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So this is at the Last Supper. Jesus is eating with his disciples. One of the disciples he's eating with is Judas, one of the unbelievers. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. So we see here, and I, I didn't put this verse in, in earlier on in the chapter, we see earlier on in the chapter, Satan put this idea into, into, into Judas to betray Jesus. But then further down in the chapter, verse 26, 27, we actually see Satan enter Judas. And then, um, you know, Judas goes to betray Jesus. Now, I think this is good evidence as well that Judas was not saved because I don't believe a saved person can be demon-possessed. Right? And the reason why I don't believe that is because in, in 1 John 4, this is the verse that most people will quote when they think about demon possession. It says here, Ye are of God, little children, have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Think about it. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not going to share his temple uh, with Satan. So I don't think it's possible for a believer to be demon-possessed. And I think the fact that Satan entered into Judas is, is evidence that Judas was not saved. I don't believe Judas was saved. Um, but that's, that's good evidence there. But... You know, can Satan influence believers? Yes, he can. But Satan is not the reason why people sin. You know, a lot of people, when they sin, they always say, well, Satan made me do it. Satan made me do this. Satan made me do that. But that's not the case. Satan can't force you to do anything, right? As a believer, especially. James 1.13, look at what it says here. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So, is Satan the reason why you sin? No, but can Satan influence you? But he influences you according to your own lusts. See here? Because it's your lusts when your lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Satan's just very smart. He just knows how to tempt people so that they succumb to the lusts that they have, and then they sin. And it's not Satan going around personally tempting everyone, but he has a lot of you know, demons, minions, that go around and do that. But you know, he influences the world as well, and people use the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, to you know tempt people to sin so let's look at some verses here where satan does influence people acts 26 18 to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light 
and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So one thing Satan is trying to do in the world is he's trying to turn people away from the true gospel. It doesn't matter what religion people believe other than the true religion. You know, whether it's atheism or whether it's Judaism or Buddhism or Hindu Hinduism, Islam, all these other, all these other New Age religions, there seems to be one created you know, every other day. That's why when people say, well, there's all these thousands of different religions because, you know, amongst these New Age religions, there's probably one getting created all the time. It doesn't matter. Satan doesn't care what other religion you believe as long as it's not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's one thing he does in the world. He tries to get people to believe falsehoods, believe lies. First Chronicles 21. Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So this is one instance in the Old Testament where Satan influenced David to do something that David, where David sinned against the Lord. Now, people speculate on what that sin is. You know, was David not trusting that, you know, God was protecting Israel and, you know, he had, a, he had enough people and a big enough army, but then he went out to go number the people. And they, a lot of people believe it was a show that he did not trust God, that he wanted to sort of know the size of the army and the size of the nation that he had. Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offence unto me, for thou savourest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So just think about what is happening here. Jesus is telling Peter the things that he's going to do for God. And Peter actively discourages that and says no. And, and, and you know the reason why he's discouraging it because he cares more about what man thinks than what God thinks. So we need to be careful because sometimes we do that. You know, where we will discourage somebody from doing great things for God, not because, you know, of a, of a concern of their welfare, but because you care about what man thinks and not what God thinks. That is like a satanic influence there in the world where people don't want to do and submit to the will of God, even though it's not a, necessarily a pleasant thing to do. Jesus is saying he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to die and rise again. And Peter thinking, you know, hey, you know, this is, this is we're thinking about the things that be of men, you know, but he may have had some concern for Jesus Christ, but then he didn't put that above, you know, what God wanted. Mark 4.15, let's keep going. Let's look at some other passages where Satan influences people. And these are they by the wayside where the, the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So something that is preached to you, Jesus can remove that from your heart. Uh, sorry, Satan can remove that from your heart and you know, make you potentially forget things. Acts 5.3 But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? So with the situation with Ananias and Sapphira in Acts, Satan had influenced Ananias and Sapphira to do those things that they did. But I don't believe when it says here, when he's filled thine heart, filled their hearts, that that's like possession, like we talked about before. That's just Satan influencing believers. So we see here in James 4, it is possible to resist Satan. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So, we talked a bit about Satan's abilities, you know, how he influences, how he can create physical infirmities, natural disasters. Hopefully that gives you a better understanding of Satan's capabilities. But, he can be resisted. You know, it's, it's not that he can just have victories in everywhere he puts his mind to, because if he did, the Bible would not say resist the devil 
and he will flee from you. That kind of reminds me of the church in Pergamos, where Satan's seat is, yet they could do great things, even where Satan was. Now let's talk a bit about why Satan exists. A lot of people wonder, they ask the question, why would God allow somebody like Satan to roam the world? You know, why would he create something like Satan? So there is a few misconceptions we have to dispel, but it's a good question. It's a valid question to say, well, if God's created the world, why would he create a creature like Satan that's caused so much havoc? Because Satan does cause a lot of havoc in the world. First Peter 5, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. I mean, it seems like... You know, people would assume if there's a good God in the world, why would he just allow a, a roaring lion just walking around seeking whom he may devour? Well, a couple of thoughts. First of all, you know, God has a purpose for Satan. But God's initial purpose for Satan was not for him to become the Satan that you know today. We talked about this last week, Ezekiel 28. Thou was perfect in thy ways, from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So just like God did not create man to war with one another and to hurt one another and to oppress one another and, and to sin, he created man to serve God and to glorify God. It's the same thing with Satan. Satan was initially created to serve God and to glorify God. I believe he was one of those cherubs, you know, on the besides the mercy seat because the bible calls him he was the anointed cherub that covereth but there was a day and this was prior to man's fall that satan rebelled against god but then you can still ask the question well when satan rebelled and is influencing the world as he does why then does god allow that well i think there is a purpose for satan and I think we can see some insights into different scriptures of why that is. And Jeremiah 25 is one of them. Let's have a look at this. Jeremiah 25, 8. This is talking about the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar, as it says here in Jeremiah 25. But notice what it says here about the king of Babylon. It says here, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words... So he's preaching to God's people and saying, you have not obeyed my commandments. Because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadrezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment, and a hissing, and a perpetual desolations. So you think, king of Babylon here, I believe here is like a picture of Satan. And even though king of Babylon, and we know Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he had, he had good and bad, because he, he ended up getting saved, right? But that aside, in this analogy, we have a wicked king being used by God to judge another nation, even God's people. So we can see here that Nebuchadnezzar is used here not only against unbelievers, but against God's people to, you know, chastise them, make a point, to, to punish them. But look at what verse 10 says. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness the voice of the bridegroom the voice of the bride the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment and these nations shall serve the king of babylon 70 years so you see because of their sin they were living in oppression and i feel it's not exactly the same because we're looking at an old testament passage we don't believe in the old testament curses but i can see something like this in the new testament where you know the sins of god's people and the, the their ungodliness puts them in a situation where they're being oppressed by wicked leaders and you say like well why do these wicked leaders exist well it's because of the disobedience of god's people and it's the same here maybe the disobedience of god's people god may use satan and his uh, 
his minions, to just chastise believers as well as punish unbelievers. And then look at verse 12. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished. So he's used Nebuchadnezzar the king for, his, uh, for a purpose that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolation. So doesn't that, isn't that the same as God allowing Satan to do wreak havoc in this world for his purposes? But then Satan is going to then be judged and he's going to be cast into hell like we talked about last week. This is why I think this passage is very similar to how God has Satan in this world. There's a purpose for him. He's using him, even though he's rebelling against God, but then ultimately he's going to get judged. And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all this that is written in this book, which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to their works of their own hands. So, you know, Satan has a purpose, and, he, and, and God uses him for a purpose. Psalm 109, verse 6, look at this. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. So God even uses Satan to punish unbelievers as well, wicked people. Romans 9, I think Pharaoh is another example of Satan. Another picture of Satan. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So think about what happened in Egypt. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. He raised Pharaoh up to lead Egypt so that he, God could show his power against Egypt with the plagues and getting the Israelites out of Egypt. So it's going to be the same with Satan. Judges 3. Look at what it says here. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many as Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. So when they went into the promised land, there were certain nations that they couldn't drive out. And God is saying here, this is the reason why he left them in there, to prove Israel, to test Israel. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know, to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. And it talks about namely five laws of the Philistines and of the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal, Hermon unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So I hope that answers the question for you. When people say, why does God allow Satan to exist? Well, I think it's very clear why he allows Satan to exist. Well, he can use him to punish believers, use him to punish unbelievers, and even here to prove believers whether they will be faithful to the Lord God. 2 Corinthians 12. He can even use Satan to humble people unless I should be exalted above measure. This is Paul. Through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And isn't this what happened to Job? Right? So we started at Job chapter 1 and 2. Why did God allow Satan to tempt Job? Well, it was to humble Job and to build Job up. Job said in Job 23.10, But he knoweth the way that I take, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as God. So we've talked about Satan's character, Satan's abilities, and now you have a good understanding, hopefully, of why God allows Satan to exist. Now the last thing I want to talk about is this phrase you see in the Bible, delivered unto Satan delivered unto satan now what is this phrase referring to first timothy 1 18 this charge i commit unto thee son timothy according to the prophecies which went before on thee that thou by them mightest war a good warfare holding faith and a good conscience which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, 
whom I, look at this, have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So this phrase here, delivered unto Satan, what is it referring to? It is referring to people being excommunicated out of church, out of the, out of the flock, out of the body of Christ. Now I want you to think about this. I want you to reflect on this. God is likening getting out of church as being delivered unto Satan. So you tell me whether or not being part of church is important. You know, some people think today, well, you don't need to be in church. Well, if getting out of church is called being delivered unto Satan, I'd say it's pretty important that people are part of a body. Remember we talked about Satan walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour? Who does the lion go after? The one that strays from the flock. That's why when you're kicked out of the flock, you're being delivered unto Satan. You're being thrown to the wolves. You're being thrown to the lion. right? Because you're out of God's house. 1 Corinthians 5.4 Look, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is the Corinthian fornicator, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So what were they doing when they were delivering the Corinthian fornicator unto Satan? What well, says it later on in the chapter, 1 Corinthians 5.13, But them that are without God judgeth, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. 1 Timothy 5.11, this is talking about the younger widows, but the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax one ton against Christ, they will marry. So he's saying here there's a danger taking on women that should be getting remarried, right? Because why? Having damnation because they've cast off their first faith and with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house and not only idle but tattlers also and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. You see, they cast off their first faith and get into these sins and, you know, they, they get out. So I want you to understand the importance of church because sometimes people take church for granted. You don't realize the importance of church, the importance of being part of the body, keeping you on the right track. And some people have the mindset, well, you know, do I really need to be in church? Well, first of all, yes, you do, because Hebrews 10 tells us, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. I mean, how are you considering one another if you're not part of a body to consider one another with? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So it's important to be part of church. So important to the fact that when people are kicked out of church, the Bible uses the phrase being delivered unto Satan, being thrown to the walls, being thrown to the lion. So understand the importance of church. You know, understand you have to be in church. You know, you show me the person that's not in church and that's the person that's backslidden, that's not living for God. You know, people tell me all the time, church is not important, it doesn't really matter if you're in church. Well, just find the person that's not in church and then you tell me how their spiritual life is. You know, are they doing well or are they doing poorly? Are they living godly or are they living worldly? No, they're living worldly because there is something spiritual that goes on at church when you're together with God's people under the preaching of God's word, you're staying on the right path and you are amongst God's people. So don't be deceived. Church is is a critical part of your Christian life. And it's dangerous to be away from the flock. So we finish where we started. 2 Corinthians 2.11, like we talked about last week, but I just want to reiterate it. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So don't be ignorant of what Satan is like. 
so you're not, so you know to be less like him. You know, we saw the sort of characteristics he has, but we don't also want to be ignorant of what Satan is capable of. So we're not like Job's wife and we charge God foolishly. And we say, oh, God's making me do this. God did this, God did that. Where it could, it could be Satan. And we don't want to be ignorant of why Satan exists because a lot of these questions might you know, trip you up. But if you have the right answers, you can explain to people, no, well, God is using Satan. He didn't create Satan like this. Satan was created perfect. Satan has rebelled and he's using Satan just like he used Pharaoh, just like he used King Nebuchadnezzar, and just the, na the wicked nations that were around Israel. So don't be ignorant of that either. And lastly, like we talked about, don't be ignorant of the importance of church to protect yourself from Satan. You know, you don't, be delivered, you don't need to be delivered unto Satan if you're delivering yourself unto Satan <laughs> by getting out of church. So let's make sure we're in church, make sure we're walking in God's ways and let's do great things for God because even if we live in a dark world like in Pergamos we can still do great things for God in that dark place let's pray Lord we thank you for loving us thank you for using us Lord I pray that you'll use us to do great things help us not to lose hope help us not to quit on doing good things and doing good works and I pray, Lord, that you know, you'll keep everyone close to the flock so that they will uh, walk in your ways, they'll provoke one another to good, uh, unto love and to good works. And uh, Lord, uh, I pray, Lord, that we would uh, fight against Satan and not help Satan in his cause. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.